The CBS Evening News. Faith Daniel sitting in tonight for Susan Spencer. Good evening, everyone. The Republican Party tonight is faced with the agony of victory. David Duke, self-styled Republican and a former leader of the Ku Klux Klan, won a close election to the Louisiana legislature. But the Republican Party wants to keep it from becoming a setback for the GOP, which has made big gains in the South in recent years. Peter Van Sant reports. It's a beautiful morning. I think it's a new dawn for politics in Louisiana. A triumphant David Duke, the man who was once a leader in the Ku Klux Klan and who wore the Nazi swastika, tonight is celebrating his election to the Louisiana State Legislature, an election which has turned the state's political establishment on its ear. This victory was the greatest single political upset in Louisiana history. Duke beat fellow Republican John Treen despite opposition from Presidents Bush and Reagan, civil rights groups, and a $60,000 ad campaign financed by the National Republican Party. He's a master of deception. He conned them into believing that he was something that he is not. We know what he really is. It was one of those things that you thought might happen, but it was your worst nightmare. Duke's victory is also a nightmare for the Republican Party, whose chairman is moving quickly to discredit the former Klansman. I intend to go to the executive committee of the Republican National Committee tomorrow and censor him. And this will, in effect, to excommunicate him from the Republican National Committee. I'd like to inform Mr. Atwater that I won this election. I'd like to inform Mr. Atwater that the people have spoken. I'm a Republican, too. I'm just as much a Republican as Lee Atwater. Civil rights leaders are worried that Duke's win will encourage racists to join mainstream political parties. Duke, a former Klansman winning the election in Louisiana, must not be seen in isolated terms. It is a, a symptom of a, a deeper crisis in racial polarization in the country. Duke's victory is a major embarrassment for the Republican Party, which put the prestige of two presidents into the campaign. It may also be a major setback in the effort to attract blacks to the GOP, because for now, the party has a former Klansman in its ranks, who claims he's just a misunderstood conservative Republican. Peter Van Sant, CBS News, Metairie, Louisiana. President Bush is four square behind his man for defense secretary. That's the word from all fronts tonight as the Bush administration tries to rally support for the John Tower nomination, due for a showdown committee vote later this week. Mark Phillips reports. Secretary of State James Baker and Vice President Dan Quayle flew to Camp David today to go over plans for this week's Far East trip with President George Bush. But one month into the Bush presidency, attention continues to center around a Washington hotel and the comings and goings of Senator John Tower, the still unconfirmed nominee for Secretary of Defense. The FBI has been questioning State Department security official Bern Indahl about Tower's personal conduct during arms negotiations in Geneva, and another report is due tomorrow. But administration officials were dispatched today to reaffirm the president's support. Uh, I can tell you that uh, the president has uh, continues to have uh, every confidence in Senator Tower, and uh, I, I know of no reason why uh, uh, there would be any change in that. President Bush, whose only public event this weekend was a dinner with Prince Charles, is said to want to push the Tower nomination before his midweek departure for Japan. Republicans are closing ranks as the Senate committee vote on Tower approaches. There comes a time you have to say this is enough, and I think we ought to stop checking every rumor, unless it's some criminal activity. Right. Let's, let's get on to the okay. vote. Administration officials have called each of the allegations against Tower a dry hole. But the suggestion that Tower has a weakness for women and drink is one that continues to worry Democrats. The ability of a person to respond, to bring judgment to bear on a moment's notice at any time, uh, is, I think, an important element uh, in the position. The prolonged drama over the Tower nomination may well end this week. But with Tower's reputation now so publicly dragged through the mud, doubt is being expressed as to whether he can effectively run the Pentagon if and when he's finally confirmed. Mark Phillips, CBS News, Washington. Iran's Ayatollah Khomeini today rejected Salman Rushdie's apology and said the novelist would never be forgiven even, even if he, quote, repents. In Washington, Secretary Baker today called Iranian death threats against Rushdie intolerable and warned of repercussions. If Iran really is serious about rejoining the, uh, the community of civilized nations, this is not the kind of behavior that leads to that. Many Muslims consider Rushdie's novel The Satanic Verses blasphemous. The author remains in hiding in England. Still ahead on the CBS Evening News, South African police raid Winnie Mandela's home. 
and later on Inside Sunday, the Beatles, here, there, and everywhere. African police staged a pre-dawn raid this morning on the home of Winnie Mandela in Soweto. What they found will not calm the controversy over Mandela and her personal bodyguards, who like to call themselves a football club. Martha Teichner reports. The raid on the Mandela home began at four in the morning and concentrated on the servants' quarters behind the house where members of the controversial football team lived. Police took four members of the team into custody, including Jerry Richardson, the coach, who was admitted taking part in beatings at the house. Investigators pawed through clothing and documents, inexplicably touching potential evidence barehanded. They say they found traces of dried blood on wooden canes, spattered on walls, and on a knife. Police then moved inside the Mandela house itself. Family members waited quietly as they went through more clothing and political papers. They found Mrs. Mandela's photo album in the garage. By daylight, top-ranking officers in charge of the investigation had arrived with forensic teams to hunt for clues that would link members of Mrs. Mandela's football team to the abduction of four boys from a church-run shelter, followed by the beating and murder of one of them, a 14-year-old activist whose body was identified last week. There are witnesses uh, available. Just hours before police raided her home, Winnie Mandela was emphatic in her own defense. And in God's name, I am prepared to stand before any court of law, and God will be there as our judge to testify to this effect. No death took place in Mandela's house. Tonight, the South African government was quick to exploit today's events, playing them prominently on state-controlled television. The government is having a field day, charting in infinite detail the tightening of the net around Winnie Mandela. Martha Teichner, CBS News, Johannesburg. Israel's foreign minister, Moshe Ahrens, flies to Cairo tomorrow for major new Middle East peace talks. He'll meet Wednesday with Soviet foreign minister, Shevard Nadza. In Jerusalem, the almost legendary mayor, Teddy Kollek, will almost certainly be re-elected in next week's vote. But he's also expected to lose a great deal of his power. Terrence Smith has details. Teddy Kollek is running again, and this time he's running scared. In his 23 years as mayor, the tireless Viennese-born Kollek has won friends for Jerusalem around the world, raised tens of millions of dollars, and mediated between Arab and Jew in this most fractious of cities. Now, confronted by opposition from both groups, he is in danger of losing the control of the city council that has made it all work for six terms. Why, at 77, is he running again? With all the difficulties we are in, I, I think I can keep the city together for a few more years. Difficulties is a polite term for the Intifada. The violence of the Arab uprising has flowed into the streets of Jerusalem. The old city, once a magnet for Israeli shoppers and tourists, is now shuttered by a Palestinian strike most of the day. And the Arab residents who voted for Kalak in the past have been warned to boycott this election. Any Israeli mayor for me in East Jerusalem, he is an occupier, no matter whether he's good or bad. It is an occupation. Nor are the Jews of Jerusalem united behind Kalak. The Orthodox have grown dramatically in numbers and political clout since the last election. View Jerusalem as a battleground between the sacred and the profane. The profane for the Orthodox includes movies on the Sabbath and soccer games that shatter the stillness of a Saturday afternoon. Kalik has kept both available despite pressure from the Orthodox. Jerusalem is, in our opinion, not Paris, not London, not even Washington. Jerusalem is a holy city, and we would like to have a religious mayor. For Kalik, the issue is not religion, but the biblical injunction to love thy neighbor. We have to uh, make steps forward towards more tolerance in the world, and certainly the only thing that can save the city is tolerance. Critics and supporters alike give Kalik credit for calming tempers in this 3,000-year-old city on a hill. But the Intifada may have created a political chasm that not even he can bridge. Terrence Smith, CBS News, Jerusalem.
Tokyo until Wednesday, but other world leaders have already arrived for Emperor Hirohito's funeral. Bruce Morton reports that preparations for Friday's funeral have been meticulous. Yugoslavian Vice President Stana Dolans arrived late this afternoon, the first of the very many foreign dignitaries coming to Tokyo this funeral week. Tokyo has worked hard to get ready. They have rehearsed the motorcade. They have rehearsed what you do if somebody jumps into the motorcade with explosives, fireworks. This time, you do this. Well, if it snows, the motorcycle policemen have practiced driving in snow. It remains an enormous undertaking. Just seating the more than 150 VIPs at the ceremony will be complicated despite split-second scheduling. Yoshitomo Tanaka heads the secretariat in charge of planning. Uh, we allocate uh, 30 seconds for one uh, representative. Still, it will uh, last uh, uh, nearly one hour, yes. Security is a major worry. Japanese police are used to dealing with demonstrations. This one was a couple of weeks ago. But they're worried about threats of violence from terrorist groups. The police has uh, mobilized more than uh, 30,000 uh, policemen from all over the country uh, to guard the uh, most important area. If the preparations are elaborate, and they are, if the security is intensive, and it is, it's because the Japanese see this as a very important time. The end of one emperor's reign, the beginning of another's, are the official acknowledgement, they think, that Japan has passed into a new post-war era in which it will step out from the shadow of the United States and play a wider role. For the whole world, also, Japan is entering into a new world in which Japan is contribute more to the world welfare and peace and stability. Today, Prime Minister Takeshita visited the site of Friday's funeral, and this very important week has finally begun. Bruce Morton, CBS News, Tokyo. Afghan rebel groups based in Pakistan failed to agree today on an interim government they hoped to install in Afghanistan. Moderate rebel leaders walked out and refused to back the proposed prime minister, a hardline fundamentalist. Five years ago this month, a band of foreigners landed on our shores, and the country hasn't been quite the same since. Tonight on Inside Sunday, the Beatle Invasion and how the impact is still being felt.